All right, we're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, we are going to be combined. We're going to be combined this morning. Uh, we were supposed to have a missionary, and then Brother Jason texted me yesterday afternoon and said that he had double booked missionaries. And uh, so now that he said, why don't you, or could you just preach to the teens? And I said, uh, okay, I guess. Um, so uh, that's why we don't have a missionary. Now, in teen church next hour, we will have a missionary. Obviously, in the main service, there will be a missionary presenting as well. I believe it's Brother Bruno. I don't remember who. It's one of, one of the missionaries. And then Brother Terry will be tonight. Uh, he'll be presenting his ministry um, in, uh, or they're going to Tennessee to start a church. But I kind of wanted, obviously, the last three weeks, we've hit uh, missions uh, with the, with you guys, and uh, sometimes it's difficult for us to, as teenagers, to wrap our minds around it. And it's not necessarily uh, anything wrong with us. It's just sometimes we. It's hard for us to uh, make the association with other parts of the world to ourselves. And so we're going to look at uh, honestly a, a different story this morning. Story uh, most of us would know, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll look at that this morning, and then we'll head to church. But let me go ahead and pray. I don't think uh, any. Well, obviously, Teen Solani will be back on normal schedule on Wednesday. Um, what else is coming up? I don't think there's any other major. Uh, Dothan, obviously, but that's not for another month and a half. Uh, that's uh, March 6th and 7th. And uh, obviously, if you want to go, let me know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but if you want to want to go to Dothan, let me know. Uh, cost is $25. That covers your hotel. And then you'll need one one meals, uh, one meal covered. Obviously, we'll stop at a food court, uh, and you get a chance to eat. At, there's four or five different restaurants there. But then uh, the dinner is covered, and then breakfast at the hotel, and then they cover lunch as well. So only one meal, and then the 25 obviously covers your hotel as well. Uh, be a nice hotel, uh, not uh, everybody sleeping on top of each other. Uh, it'll be it'll be much or spread out. What? Uh, yes, Four Seasons Marriott, Hilton. Yes, Hilton. Um, What? Motel 6? <laughs> we got room for 35 bucks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, Motel 6 is always making you feel like you're going to get murdered. Speaking of, here's a funny story. Shh, shh. Funny story. When, when we were in, it is actually, when we were in uh, Michigan, uh, my wife and I obviously... Uh, my family lived close by, so they came to see us on a regular basis. But my wife's family didn't get a chance to get up there very often because it was cold. And so one year, uh, our sis- or her sister and brother-in-law decided, you know what? We're going to go up and visit uh, our, or my sister. And so Miss Esther and Brother Nathan came up to visit us. And we tried to get them to stay with us over and over and over and over, but they never would. So instead, they stayed in a hotel uh, up in Saginaw. Um, and um, it, ha- well, it happened the night you guys were there, right? The night, okay, the night after they left, there was a man murdered uh, in the hotel that they had stayed in the night before. So, newsflash, if your brother or sister or brother-in-law or sister-in-law invites you to stay with them, always take that option, because you never know what's going to happen in the hotel you stay in. So, (laughs) Right. Hey, yeah. As the door was closing. Hey, you want to stay with us? Oh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to pray. Shh. Oh, yeah. Uh, shh. Um, couples night out. Now, this may, applies mainly to the girls because, guys, you would not be good babysitters. Uh, but girls, February 8th, we're having our, cup, shh, our couples night out. Okay, um, and we babysit for that. Each year we make about 200. I'd like to make significantly more than that this year. And uh, we're, I've already worked with Brother John Barnes with making sure that it's advertised and promoted uh, far ahead of time. Uh, so that basically what's going to happen is uh, we give uh, babysitting here on donation type basis um, so that parents can go out and have a Valentine's Day date and that type of thing. So that'll be here. And obviously my wife will be here. And then we'll split up the groups. If you like to work with babies, you can have the babies. If you like the toddlers, you can have the toddlers. If you like the older kids, you can have the older kids. Uh, I don't like kids in general. I'm just kidding. Uh, but um, I don't do, uh, I'm so thankful. My wife and I were talking about this the other day. So thankful to be out of the diaper stage. I don't, uh, you know, you see parents, oh, cute little baby. But what you have to understand, cute little baby, but that does involve diapers. It involves uh, um, spit up and vomiting on a regular basis. And so, you know what? I'm good. Sadie's the youngest we got. And I don't know that I can handle another child. Um, I don't know that Sadie, Sadie keep, I want a baby sister. She couldn't handle somebody else getting the attention more than she does. So, um, 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we're going to look at uh, a passage here. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity once again uh, to meet like this, Lord, as we wrap up Missions Conference today, Lord, both here in Sunday school and in the service to follow and then the evening service tonight. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd continue to open our hearts, and, uh, Lord, you continue to continue to let us see how we can affect missions, Lord, whether it be worldwide or it be right here in our own area. Lord, you've given us an opportunity. You've given us an, an advantage, Lord, in all honesty. Lord, you've said saved us. Help us to be bold in giving that same gospel uh, to the rest of the world. Once again, we love you. Be with us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. What's the matter? Well, I, I know what I'm preaching on, so you've got to loosen things up. 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings follows 1 Kings. 1 Kings comes before 2 Kings. Bible scholars. How many knew that? Okay, it scares me. I only had about four hands go up. <laughs> okay, five. Now let's one up. I just didn't see it the first time. I haven't. Do you, hey, to be fair, I have not made a short joke in a long, long, long time. <laughs> yes, I am too. I'm growing and mature. Well, never mind. No, I'm not. Um, all right, 2 Kings chapter 5, I'm just going to read three verses, and we'll talk about this story here and then kind of apply it in about uh, three, really just three main uh, thoughts from it. Uh, the Bible says in chapter 5, verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man, in, a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Basically, here's what has happened. The Bible says that the Syrians, uh, Naaman was the captain of the army. Uh, they didn't necessarily have generals at this time. He would have been one uh, that would have overseen a large portion of the army. Uh, if you think during Roman times where you had a centurion or you had uh, e or other leaders that would take groups and they would go on uh, treks through areas and they would spend sometimes years away from family, a year, years away from their hometown as they were conquering. And that's what we see here. Naaman oversaw a large group of soldiers. The Bible has some really good things to say about him. It says he was a great, um, he was a great man with his master, the king. He was honorable. Uh, the Lord gave deliverance in Syria. Um, the Lord gave uh, deliverance uh, unto Syria because of him. He was a mighty man in valor, but it says he was a leper. Now, from our, um, as we've talked before, what in the Bible, when we hear leprosy, what is leprosy a picture of? Sin. Leprosy is a picture of sin. Now, obviously, in this specific story, the Bible says he was a leper. Leper was the disease. Leprosy is a nasty disease. Uh, we have it here in America. Okay, Don't touch armadillos because armadillos carry it. Uh, we call it Hansen's disease, but leprosy. Leprosy basically kills the nerves uh, to the point that whatever, finger, ear, whatever, the extremity uh, becomes dead, and then one day you're walking through and you smack your hand on a doorpost and a finger falls off because uh, you can't feel the pain in it. It's literally dead at that point. Um, but leprosy, the Bible says here, Naaman, despite all the, the uh, uh, awesome things that Naaman was, or said about Naaman here, it ends with, but he was a leper. Now, this isn't the direction of the sermon, but in all honesty, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, the Bible says we're all sinners. We can't change that. Okay? We've, all been, uh, we've all been cursed, if you will, with sin. Adam and Eve condemned us to that. Technically, it was all Eve's fault. We're not going to spend a lot of time there. But, uh, but Adam did take of the fruit as well. Uh, he submitted to the wiles of the woman. Uh, no, uh, but, um, see, I say things like that, and then I lose my train of thought. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, but, but we're all sinners. Here, you know, uh, Naaman did this. Naaman did that. Naaman was a general. He was honorable. He had all kinds of valor but he was a leper. In other words, if I can say once again in the concept of missions, everyone is in need of a savior. I think for the most part in here from testimony or from uh, uh, invitations and things that we've given, whether in, in uh, teen church or in uh, uh, teen church on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights or uh, even in other services, but for the most part in here, we would testify that we're saved. If we are saved and we're on our way to heaven, let me ask you this. When's the last time you actually told someone else about the gift that you were given. Um, I, oh, my wife and I had a chance yesterday. We went soul winning. Um, we took uh, the um, missionaries out, and we went to, um, some of you know, the area where Brother Eli used to live. 
right there off of Bellingrath. And so we drop off all these groups in there. And so we get done. All those maps are taken. And Brother Jason said, okay, now we got about a half hour. He said, um, you know, let, well, we, what other maps do you have? And I, I, well, I asked him, what other maps do you have? He said, well, we can go to the streets across the way. Now, if you've ever been down Bellingrath Road, the, it's, I mean, the, on one side of the street, A-OK. -okay. The other side, Probably over the house is a drug house, uh, and so that's where we went soul winning. Uh, so we're walking down, and uh, it was rather it was rather an interesting experience. There was one house um, that, in parked in the front yard, there was uh, a Mercedes, uh, an Escalade, and uh, a Range Rover. Uh, that I think the Range Rover was worth more than the whole house was. And uh, in the time we were going down that street, four different times, four nice cars came down, stopped. A guy got out of the car, went into the house, was in there about five minutes, came back out, got in the car, and drove away. And I don't think they were passing out Bible verses. Uh, just saying. Um, but uh, that's where uh, we're going in there. But we came up to a house, knocked on a door in a, well, I, my wife said she was about 40. She looked like she was about 60 to me. Um, but knocked on the door. Her name was Margaret Box. Margaret Box came to the door and was able to go through the plan of salvation with her and she got saved i was able to explain to her you know i for me it was august 28th 1988 and i was in sunday school four years old teacher talked about heaven and hell and hell terrified me i mean heaven sounds every heaven sounds great to everybody when you start talking about hell and the things you know the bible has more to say about hell than it does heaven and i think i don't honestly as human beings we fear and so understanding the reality of that but being able to tell her you know what here's this and here's what the here's what my sunday school teacher told me and here and now for the last 31 years i've known that i'm on my way to heaven and that's what the opportunity we have somebody gave us that gift at some point and here we find naaman naaman was a leper now, in their conquering, they had conquered the uh, land of uh, Samaria, Israel, whatever you want to call it, and uh, they had taken people captive. They had conquered it, destroyed it, and they had taken people captive. And um, uh, Naaman here had taken this little girl, probably seven- or eight-year-old little girl, and she was uh, a servant directly to Naaman's wife. Uh, she was a, the Bible calls her a handmaid, and uh, basically she was, this, she was there to wait hand and foot on Naaman's wife. Whatever Naaman's wife wanted, that's what she did. Um, and in some cases, now not this case necessarily, but if you ever look through history, you get a chance, you guys that are in history classes and things, you hear the term chamberlain or chambermaid, study up on what those things mean sometimes. Pretty, uh, it's it, not a pleasant, not a pleasant place to be a servant, uh, as a chamberlain or chambermaid. But this, uh, this girl here, she's, a, the Bible says she was a servant to his wife. And uh, as a result, obviously took care of all that. Remember, Naaman was a leper. And you can imagine this little girl and uh, Naaman's wife having a conversation one day, and she knew he had leprosy and all that. And uh, so her telling then uh, Naaman's wife, she said, w uh, w I wish he was in, the Bible says, uh, uh, she says, how'd she say it? Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria. She said, I wish he was able to meet this prophet in Samaria, because if he could, or if he could meet him, that prophet could heal him of his leprosy. Now, Naaman had probably tried multiple things. Uh, you think with his status in society, his status in the army, multiple times, I guarantee you, he'd gone to this doctor and to that doctor and maybe this person and this person and tried essential oils and tried all this different stuff. Nothing could heal him of his leprosy, though. And she says, well, you know what? Maybe this, the prophet in, in, in Samaria, he could heal him. And so you can imagine Naaman's, um, Naaman's de in his desperation thinking, well, I've tried everything else. Why not? And so we know the story. The Bible says he goes there, and Elijah tells him, "Go." And, or, I'm sorry, Elijah sends word by his servant uh, to go dip in the Jordan seven times, and the argument and stuff that goes back and forth there. Once again, I think one of the there aren't a whole lot of uh, salvation pictures in the New Testament, but I think this passage here is a very solid one in regards to he had to do it God's way. Uh, in other words, uh, you think of the story with uh, Noah's Ark. There was only one door into Noah's Ark. Uh, and they had to go in that way, and at some point God closed that door. Uh, when the children of Israel were um, uh, murmuring against Moses, and the Bible says God sent fiery serpents into the camp, they had to look at the serpent. They had to look at the one brazen serpent that was held up. They couldn't do it this way or this way or this way. They had to go through that one way. And once again, not necessarily preaching on salvation this morning, but understanding it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how good your family's been, how good your mom and dad are. It doesn't matter this or that. We all have to come to salvation the same way. And that's by Jesus, by his, by his uh, sacrifice on Calvary. That's the only way we can, we can accept salvation, the only way salvation comes. And so here we find, uh, the Bible says that Elisha sends him uh, to, um, uh, to, to uh, dip in the Jordan River seven times. He ends up doing it. He ends up being healed. And we understand that whole story. All that to go back to this little girl. She's the one I want to focus on. You know, her personal state, I want you to read the way I have it and then explain it. Her personal state played no role in the help that she gave to somebody else. 
Sometimes we let our state, whether uh, our state of life or maybe a state of our emotions and things like that, play a role in whether or not we're willing to witness to somebody. Um, I told you before, God, God has blessed us. God has given us the opportunity to hear the gospel. He has sent us out to give the gospel, or I'm sorry, he sent somebody to us to give us the gospel. Um, I told you a little bit my testimony already. When I was uh, four years old, the teacher's name, uh, her name was Mrs. Carol Peters. Um, I doubt she ever, honestly, I doubt she remembers that, you know, 31 years ago, she gave the gospel to me. But everything that's happened since then, everything that's happened in my life, you think of uh, different things that have been able to be accomplished with different people, she's received rewards for that because of her willingness to say, you know what, this four-year-old boy needs the gospel, I'm going to give it to him. And I don't know who God sends across your path, but there's no accident to the people that come across your path. I've told you, I've joked with you guys before, one of the places I hate the most is the gas station because you get out to pump gas and somebody walks up ne- or somebody pulls up next to you at the thing, they begin pumping gas and the Holy Spirit says, hey, why don't you give that person a track? Why don't you talk to that person about church? And honestly, condemning myself, being very transparent, but a lot of times it's, ah, click, put it back in, jump in my car and drive away. Not listening to what the Holy Spirit says. Now, I don't know if I'm that person's only chance. Um, and I've told you before how sad it would be if we get, or when we get to heaven, uh, before God wipes away all tears from our eyes, if we get, when we get to heaven, and I don't know that it's going to happen this way, but you can imagine a gigantic line of people waiting one by one as they step up in line, and Jesus looks for their name in the Lamb's book of life, and he looks, and he sees your name, and yes, enter thou into the joy of the Lord, then you head off into heaven, and you turn around, and you see maybe a neighbor, or somebody from the grocery store, somebody that you saw on a regular basis in Mobile, or Theodore, or at your school, and they, Jesus looks in the Lamb's Book of Life and says, you know what, your name's not here, and sends them to hell for all eternity for that person to turn around to you and look and say, why did you never tell me? All those times we spent together, I was at your, ho- at your house for this, and we did this together, and this, and this, and we went to school from K-4 through 12th grade together, all these things, and not one time did you tell me. And that's why I think at that point we're going to realize, you know what, I messed up. And that person's going to pay the penalty for all eternity for us, now, don't get me wrong, it's their own sins that put them there, but I had the opportunity to tell them and never did. And here this little girl says, you know what, it said, you know what, it doesn't matter that where I'm at. You, know, you can imagine, I mean, you think of the bitterness that could come from being taken captive. She was taken away from her family, probably saw her family killed. More than likely her father was killed, whether he was in the army or was there. They're not going to take the men captive. They took the women and children captive to try to, you think of the story of Daniel where they took the choice children, the Bible says, to try to raise them as Babylonians. And so they bring her, the Syrians bring her here, and she hate, probably hated the Syrians. And how easy it would have been, you know what, I don't care, I'm glad he's got leprosy, because he did this, and he did this, and he did this, I'm glad he's got leprosy, but we don't find that from her at all. Her personal state played no role whatsoever in helping this man. Now, once again, she couldn't do the helping. She could lead him to the person that could help, and just like we, when we go out and present the gospel to somebody, nobody in here can save anybody else. God can, and it's up to us to get them to that. There's a song. I was going to look up the lyrics, and I forgot, to be honest with you. A song, but got, got to get to Jesus. You got to get, get, get them there. Why? He's the only one that can help them. The story with the uh, four men uh, that brought their friend. Their friend, I think he had the palsy, the Bible says. And uh, they brought him uh, across uh, however much distance, and uh, there where Jesus was in somebody's house. And in turn, uh, they got to that house, and they tried to get in. The Bible says that the crowd was so thick around there. The crowd was so pressed on that house that they couldn't get in. And you think you get to that point, you think, well, I've tried, or, you know, I, God, if you give me an opportunity, I'm going to witness to this person. And God brings that person across your path, and you're left with a choice at this point. Am I going to present the gospel to him like I told God I would? Or am I going to do my own thing and ignore that and, and pretend like it didn't happen? But these four men didn't do that. The Bible says these four men couldn't get in. You can imagine looking in the windows. There's no way to do it. And they look up, and they climbed up, climbed up on the roof, pulled him up on the roof, and then tore that roof open to let him down. And the Bible says that God forgave the sins of that man because of his friends. His friends were willing to get him to that point. Obviously, he had to accept the gift as well. But ultimately, God said, look, you have friends that love you. Let me ask you this. Do you love people? Now, it's hard to love some people. I'm not going to lie. Okay, there's some people in life that are a lot easier to love than others. That's, just, that's human nature. That doesn't make it right, but that's human nature. There are people you get along with. There are people you don't get along with. There are people that are, eh, I mean, I don't love, love them or hate them. But in light, or but in this case here, she had a perfect reason to hate this man for everything that he had done. I mean, he's the top, one of the top leaders in the Syrian army, and she had a perfect right to hate him, but she didn't. She was willing to say, you know what, it doesn't matter what he's done, it doesn't matter where he's from, 
I'm gonna, I, I want to give him the opportunity. So first of all, her personal state played no role in it. But second of all, she did what she could to help. We're limited on what we can do. Um, one of the things that, uh, and I'm not condemning any individual for this, one of the things that my wife and I have talked about before with um, helping people, I see people, they go off on medical mission trips, and medical mission trips are fantastic, but we're called to give the gospel. In other words, you think of it this way, if, if I, we take a mission trip and uh, some person comes to me and maybe they have this, this problem or this, this issue, think of third world countries and, and uh, um, in this direction anyway, uh, have this, this issue or that issue, and as a, a doctor being able to, I know exactly how to fix that, and uh, in the first world, in first world nations, this kind of stuff doesn't happen, here's how we fix it, taking the time to fix that, great job, send them on the merry way, and then the person dies and go to hell, what did I accomplish? Because the Bible calls us to give the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for helping people. I'm all for things like a food pantry and all that kind of stuff, helping people. But ultimately, we're called to give the gospel. And here, this girl did what she could. She couldn't tell Naaman, you need to do this. But she said, I wish you would take this opportunity. You know, as Christians, we, God gives us, as I said earlier, God gives us all, many opportunities. When's the last time you took that opportunity? Um, if I can meddle a little bit, some of you shock me as how fast you go through our teen soul maps on Wednesday. Sometimes I wonder, do you even knock on the door? You know, we're not, sometimes like when we're doing uh, flyers and things for Easter, in most of those cases, we're just sticking them in the door and we're trying to cover as much area as possible. But when we go soul winning, it's an opportunity to present the gospel to someone. Now, I, I agree, some of the neighborhoods we go in, it's very hard. Houses are, well, we checked out Jordan and I this past, or this past Wednesday. Uh, Jordan somehow got missed on the list, so Jordan ended up going soul with me. Uh, but we went, uh, we're going through a neighborhood there, and there was a house for sale. We were talking about, just talking about the, the niceness of the houses in the neighborhood. And so I, there was one for sale. I thought, let me check it out. $475,000 house. Okay. Now, if you look at the pictures, honestly, it wasn't that impressive inside. I mean, it was nice, but it wasn't like you'd think. And I know as a teenager, sometimes it's hard to go up to a house that's four or $500,000 and then for that person to listen to you tell them that they're a sinner and on their way to hell. It just does, I understand that. But at least give them the opportunity. Because you know what? Uh, do you know for sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven? No, I don't want to. Get off my porch. When you get to heaven, you may shed tears over the fact that they didn't take advantage of it, but you won't shed tears from the fact that you, didn't get, you, you gave them an opportunity. They rejected that opportunity. And so in turn, once again, we don't want to see anybody go off to hell, but what we understand is, you know what, I gave that opportunity. It would be like throwing, <clears throat> if we were on, the, uh, on a boat, well, if you were on a boat, if you were all on a boat, I wouldn't be anywhere near that boat. Um, but uh, if we were on a boat and somebody went, or somebody went overboard, and uh, you know what, they can't swim, and you threw a ring to them, I don't want that ring. Well, we gave them the opportunity. If that person drowns, is it going to make us sad? Yes, but I tried to help them. And they didn't want any part of it. And that's here. She came and she said, look, I wish he would go do this. I can't make him do it. I'm not his boss, but I wish he could. We're limited on what we can do. We're limited on, once again, you can't argue anybody into heaven. I, uh, when I was uh, a teenager, um, as some of you know, probably all of you, I enjoy arguing. Um, I'll argue about important things. I'll argue about stupid stuff. It doesn't matter. I just enjoy arguing. I enjoy the debate. Um, now, when the debate becomes juvenile and it becomes, well, your mom with this, that, at that point, it's not even a debate anymore because uh, my mom is better than yours. I'm just kidding. Um, but, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, but I remember as a teenager going out, and I remember my youth pastor saying uh, when we came into the youth group, him saying, look, you cannot argue anybody into heaven. You come to a door and you knock on that door, and that person wants nothing to do with it, or they make this statement or that statement. There's nothing you can do to argue them into heaven. It's got, if, if they're wanting to argue, the Holy Spirit's not working in, in their heart at that moment. And you may be the one planting the seed, or you may be pouring water on that seed, but ultimately it's not up to you. You just simply move on from that point. And I remember going to a door and uh, knocking on a door as a teenager, and I literally spent 45 minutes arguing with this guy. Now, I enjoyed all 45 minutes of it, but we only got through three houses on our entire block that we were supposed to get done because I argued with this guy for so long. And I remember then getting on the bus, and um, I think uh, the kid that was with me ratted on me. Uh, but uh, the, my youth pastor came to me later when we were at the restaurant and, and you know, just kind of brought up the, you know, the arguing and all that. And he said, now, he said, look, Ben, you understand. He said, uh, you, may have, uh, you may have pushed that person away from church, but let's just say everything's, he's, he's no different than he was before. What about the rest of the block that God may have had somebody prepared to hear the gospel down that block 
and because you were arguing with this guy, they never got to hear. Um, and it, it convicted me, even as a seventh grader, understanding that, you know what, I can't argue them into heaven. This little girl here, she couldn't make name and go do this. She did what she could. You know what, there's a man in Samaria, he can help you, but you're going to have to go see him. You're going to have to go find him. You're going to have to go take, or, uh, take care of whatever business with him, and he can help you. We're limited on what we can do, but here's the thing. In our limitations, God is not limited. It's amazing. Uh, missionaries have always fascinated me. You see, uh, missionaries go out when I... Um, remember as a teenager, even as a kid growing up and hearing the different missionaries that would come and this missionary would uh, this and this missionary this and uh, you see the, the uh, uh, amazing things that, you, you know, and once again, I'm not, I'm not raising any one missionary above another, but sometimes you hear uh, missionaries that went to places uh, like Papua New Guinea uh, that even when I was a kid, uh, missionaries that went to Papua New Guinea, Papua New, Papua New Guinea at that point really wasn't settled if you will, there's still a lot of tribes. You think of people that would go to the Amazon and places like that where no, but no missionary, no English-speaking missionary has ever been seen in that area. Seeing a missionary go there, now once again, I'm not taking away from a missionary that goes to uh, England or goes to France or places like that. But understand, thinking, you know what, God's using them to do that. I've told you before, God calls different people to different positions for a reason. My cousin, my cousin, missionary in the Philippines, God designed him to be a missionary. Now, I wouldn't have said that when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we would have just said, something's odd about him. Well, we did say that, to be honest with you. I'm just being honest with you. We, he, something was off. He was just different. But where he's at now in the Philippines, God has designed him for exactly where he's at. And God has designed each of us for what he has for us. And here, God, uh, it's, it's hard for us to comprehend. But this little girl here understood, you know what? I'm here for a reason. And she said, you know what? You want to be healed of the leprosy? Or if I can make a comparison, you want to be healed of that sin? You want to be on your way to heaven? Here's how you do it. That's what God's assigned for us. I'm all for going out, and we should. We should give money to the missionaries, and we should send them to every country of the world. I love what Pastor said the other night, that we looked specifically for some missionaries that were going to countries that we had no missionaries in because we're trying to reach the world. But let me ask you this. In all of that, okay, I think most of you in here are old enough to do faith promise. It may not be 50, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month. It may be a dollar a week. It may be 50 cents a week. I don't know, but I think we're all old enough to do that. And once again, I'm all for getting the gospel to the world. But let me ask you this. When's the last time you got the gospel to somebody in Mobile or Theodore? Well, I support missions, but do you go soul winning? And I'm not talking about you get on the bus on Wednesday, you walk down, and you put tracks in the door, although that is important. But when's the last time you took the time to tell someone about what God did for you? Well, I don't know what the words to say. Okay. There's not any specific magic potion. There's no special words. Just tell them what God did for you. Well, on this date, here, you know, this, and I understood I was on my way to hell, and that's all there is to it. You know, we try to make it into some major complicated thing, and it's not. The gospel is simple. I actually asked my wife um, after we talked to uh, Margaret Box yesterday, as, or as we're walking away, I said, sometimes I feel like I make it too simple. Um, and my wife said, the, the gospel is simple. When you, add, when you begin to add things to the gospel, that's what complicates it. And God condemned the Pharisees over and over and over for complicating or for uh, uh, um, making the gospel a very difficult thing, and it's not. The Bible says the faith of a child. Now, I don't know many complicated children. Children are pretty simple. Most of you are simple, okay? In other words, it, 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 well, I have to do this. I have to, I have to, I, well, no, no. Look uh, To me, look at the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, the Bible says, uh, he turned to the Lord, he turned to Jesus, or he turned to the uh, other thief first and basically said, do you, know, do you realize who you're talking to? This is the Son of God and that conversation. And then he says, Jesus, remember, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. We don't see him uh, doing all these other special things. No, all he did was believe. And sometimes we complicate it. And here this little girl said, look, you want to be healed of your leprosy? That's the guy that can help you. And as Christians, that's what we're called to do. You want to be healed of your sin? Point him to Jesus. Not point him to you. Not point him to, point him to Jesus. And that's the opportunity we have every week. That's what's written out in that track. That's what's written out in your Bible is how to do that or how to get them to Jesus. So we see, first of all, her personal state didn't uh, or played no role uh, in her helping. Second of all, she did what she could to help. We're limited. God is not. But then last of all, um, oh, where'd it go? Oh, she knew where that help was. And I already alluded, alluded to that a little bit there at the end of the, the last point. She knew where the help was. Now, here's the thing. You, you've heard the statement before. You can get a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. 
Okay? You can't force somebody into salvation, but you can get them to where they realize, you know what, I'm on my way to hell. Once again, you can't argue uh, people in heaven. There have been times before, and it's, it's, not, it's more rare nowadays than it was a while ago. Uh, but you ask somebody now, uh, usually what I'll say in, in the, uh, presenting the gospel, I'll say to them now, you know, I'm a sinner. And I, I said, you know, I've been on the earth for 35 years now. I've done thousands of sins. I'm not proud of that, but I'm a sinner. And usually the person that's with me, yesterday it was my wife. This is my wife. She's definitely a sinner. No, uh, but, uh, you know, and I always use that. I always try to make it, let them know, first of all, I'm a sinner. And then I ask them, now I'm sure you'd have to admit you're a sinner too before, right? And ever, most people, oh, yeah. But I've had people before go, no. And that now as I'm older, I'm, at that point you realize, you know what? They're not ready, and just move on. But as a teenager, I remember, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever, and starting going through a list of sins, no, 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 no. And 10 minutes later through the conversation, I'm no further ahead than I was 10 minutes ago. And once again, understanding, you know what? They're not ready. You have to understand, uh, in, in the uh, Great Commission, the Bible says, all power is given unto me. Jesus says, look, God's given all power to me. In other words, all we are is the vessel that goes out and says, do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? God could, if I could say it this way, God could do that with a rock if he wanted to. We're simply a tool that God uses to do it. I, we have to make sure we get out of the way of, well, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to convince them a sinner. You can't convince somebody they're a sinner. Okay? Either they know they're a sinner or they don't know. And that's something only the Holy Spirit can do. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit working inside our hearts and convicting our hearts and saying, you know what, this is where uh, this is where this person is at. This person's ready, this person's not. And I mentioned earlier about sometimes we're the seed planter. Sometimes we're the seed waterer. Sometimes we're this or we're that. We're, there's, uh, there's no telling where each and every person is in that, uh, that line of the gospel being presented. But here's the thing. Wherever you're at, are you willing to do so? My whole application of it all, I already mentioned a minute ago, I'm all for world missions, and we should. We should send people all across the world. We have, I think, uh, Pastor said, I think 110 missionaries, and uh, we had, uh, we're, I think, looking to take on maybe 10 more with people who have come in the past and people who are uh, the ones we have currently at our conference. And then Pastor's also talking about wanting to send out some uh, church planters and things from uh, people or uh, other or, um uh, other people who come to us looking to help plant churches, looking for to do that. Why? Because we're wanting to get the gospel to every creature. And once again, that is vitally important. But on your level, when's the last time you presented the gospel to somebody your age? You see, uh, uh, we had at, uh, I think it was Thursday service at chapel. I think we had four, four people raise their hand for salvation. Okay. And I went, I've talked to, I've talked to three of them and kind of, and uh, all three of them were saved. They just, through some different circumstances, didn't know. But have you ever had, and I'll, I'm not going to say who it was, but I do want to give uh, credit. We had one specific teenager back at the beginning of the year. Uh, we had some new students come in and one specific teenager went to a new student during school revival and basically asked them, do you know for sure you're on the way to heaven? And the parent of that child came to me and said, I'm so thankful to have my child in a school where that kind of thing happens. That was somebody who's concerned. You know what? I don't know if that person's on the way to heaven or not, but I want to make sure. If they don't want it, then that's on them. But I want to at least give them that opportunity. Uh, we all want an opportunity for everything in life. Nobody likes to be passed over for an opportunity. We like to be asked things. Why, even if we turn it down, we still like to be asked. In this case, when's the last time you presented the gospel to somebody? Passing out tracts is important. Giving money to world missions is important. But when's the last time you took the time to open a Bible or to even flip that track open? The English side, obviously, because I don't know that any of you would do any good if you did it in Spanish. But the English side, flip it open and just go through those verses. The Bible says that God's word will not return void. Sometimes you don't understand and you, you get done talking to him and you think, I don't think they understood a word I said. But if the Holy Spirit's working, honestly, I don't think it matters outside of you saying something ridiculously foolish. But I, don't think, I think the Holy Spirit will work through it. But have you given him that opportunity? Everybody in here has a friend that's either not here or is not saved, myself included. Have, do, or first of all, do they know you go to church? Do they know you know the Lord? But have you presented the gospel to them? It's like I said, when we get to heaven, that I think the majority of the tears that God's going to have to wipe away are tears from us realizing, I wasted this opportunity, and I wasted that opportunity, and I wasted that opportunity. 
You've heard the story before. I think uh, Brother Andrew told the story when he preached in chapel a little while back uh, about the guy who uh, was part of the original three that founded Apple, then sold his stock for a certain amount, I think like $800 or something. And that stock today would be, it's an astronomical number today. And the opportunity that he missed out on, the opportunity that we have to present the gospel to the world is far more important than any amount of money that's out there. Have you taken advantage of that? Have you told someone else about Jesus? This little girl here, didn't matter where she was from, didn't matter how much she may have disliked this person or that, she knew, you know what, I know I have the answer for him. I'm going to give him the answer and said, look, if you go to this, this man, go to this prophet, he'll help you. He knows exactly what to do. She did what she could. You're limited Especially being teenagers, but you're limited. Now, I will say this. You have a greater opportunity to reach your generation than any of the adults in here do. If, honestly, you think of it this way. If uh, Brother O and Brother Turner and myself all dressed in teenage dress nowadays and we walked into your school, all three of you would look at us and, or, or you'd look at all three of us and think, what's wrong with them? But here's the thing. You have interaction with them every day. They would think we were odd. People think I'm odd now for hanging out with teenagers. Okay, now I am odd, not just for hanging out, I'm just an odd person, okay? But you have an opportunity. Whether you go to public school, you go to Lighthouse, your home school, whatever the case may be, have you told anybody about the Lord? You're limited, God is not. God's, God is not limited in any way. And especially when it comes to salvation, God, the Bible says there's no respecter of persons. God wants to see every person saved. Now, not every person is going to get saved. People are going to reject God. That happens. But have you given the opportunity? And then last of all, get them to Jesus. He's the only hope they have. He's the only hope we have. But he's the only hope they have. Have you gotten, him th- gotten them there? Gotten them to the point where, look, Jesus has the answer for you. Here's how to find Jesus. Once again, if they say, no, I don't want any part of it, that's on them. I can walk, if you can say it this way, you can walk away, dust off your hands. The Bible says with the disciples, if somebody rejects it, shake off the dust of your feet at the door and keep going. Why? Because you've given them an opportunity. They don't want it. But you have to, we need to at least give them the opportunity. Let's my eyes and pray. Thank you.